we are taking a totally different perspective now. Uh, we have been discussing extensively about uh, nanotechnology, nanotechnology regulations, and everything about safe by design approaches. Safe by design, by design, there are other legal principles. Uh, and you have seen that already um, this, this afternoon, for those of you who are in, in Europe, uh, in the presentation about the EU regulatory environment, uh, in the legal wording, we find um, expressions such as safe by design in other fields and in a totally other technological field. Uh, I mean technological because it applies or it entails the use uh, of other technologies. We find uh, also a by design approach. Uh, here we speak more specifically about privacy by design. And as lawyers, we, we, we need to take also lessons and to draw conclusions from uh, other legal principles that have been already adopted in other fields uh, because that can be very instructive. And it is therefore my uh, high honor to welcome um, Professor Ira Rubinstein. Uh, Ira Rubinstein is currently professor at the New York University Law School. Before, he spent uh, several decades uh, as uh, and ended up as uh, Deputy General Counsel of uh, Microsoft. He was in charge of global affairs of Microsoft and more precisely of privacy issues. So we have here with us today uh, a top world expert of privacy laws who was lawyer in private practice, was also in academia. And I give him the floor. Ira, thank you very much for your attendance. Uh, thank you very much, Anthony. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me just say a bit about my background before. Um, launching into the presentation. Um, and I want to emphasize that my time at Microsoft, where I was responsible for both privacy and security related issues, has had a lot of influence on my thinking about this. And in particular, I was around at Microsoft in the early 2000s during what was called the Windows security push. And this might predate a lot of you, but you're probably aware that Windows had a very bad security reputation. And in 2002, uh, the then CEO, Bill Gates, decided to do something quite radical about this, which was essentially to shut down all Windows development for a month. Quite a drastic step in order to provide remedial training and new methods for developing Windows on a safer basis. And at the same time, the security team developed something called the Security Development Lifecycle, which was a life cycle oriented approach to the development uh, of software on a secure basis. Um, and this has been fairly successful uh, and is also, I think, very influential in thinking about similar methodologies with, with privacy. And one thing it demonstrates, I think, too, quite importantly, is that in order to do any of this seriously, and I overheard a, a bit of the last presentation, so I think there is some overlap with safety by design and nanotechnology. And in order to do this for real, it's very costly. It's very demanding. It can't just be an afterthought. And shutting down all Windows development for a month is a good indicator of the size and the, and the scope of the commitment required to do something like this. So for the past 13 years, I've been a professor at NYU Law School. And during that time, I've written three articles on privacy by design. Um, I'm not going to go through each one of those so much as to draw out uh, some of the broad themes from them. And again, I think there should be a fair amount of overlap, but as to this presentation, it's really about privacy by design. I know very little, if anything, about the safety by design movement or nanotechnology, so I'm hoping that you'll be able to draw useful comparisons and that there'll be some time for discussion at the end, so I'll move pretty rapidly. So th these are just some of the things that I want to cover today, and I think it'll become clear why I uh, selected these, these topics as we go along. I won't walk through it in advance. So let's begin with the very basic idea that in order to pursue an approach or even a movement, if you want to call it that, like safety by design, you have to decide up front what is it that you're seeking to achieve. And in the privacy world, the, the, the mantra that emerged around privacy by design was to safeguard personal data by 
by building privacy into products and services and not adding it on after the fact. And this means a couple of things. One is that you need to be aware of the relevant privacy issues and how they might play out. You need to be aware of the features and characteristics of the product or service that's being offered and how they implicate privacy. And then you have to think through the necessary safeguards to achieve uh, the goal of safeguarding privacy, which essentially boils down to protecting personal data. Now, very quickly, there emerged a division between two rather different approaches to achieving privacy by design. One that came to be known as privacy by policy and the other privacy by architecture. Privacy by policy would be something like, we never sell your data. So the company makes a pledge. It has maybe some organizational measures in place, maybe some policies even to the level of if you violate that policy as an employee, you'll be terminated. But it's words, it's, it's process and it's words, but it's not technology in the sense that if somebody chooses to violate that policy and sell a user's data, there's nothing technologically preventing that employee from doing so. Privacy by architecture, on the other hand, suggests engineering methods and the use of technology to not only make the pledge, but to back up the pledge through technological means so that it's not even possible to um, sell the data. So for example, the data could be anonymized or the data could be encrypted or the data could be subject to access controls in ways that would make it, if not impossible, then at least technologically very challenging without breaking or hacking the system um, to violate that policy. And in fact, privacy by design has deep roots in cryptography. I'll talk about that a little more in a moment as well as a reliance on a number of you know, very sophisticated cryptographic protocols for things like anonymous communications, for using multiple pseudonyms that can't be linked so that you're tracked and profiled, for untraceable payment systems that allow you to show that you both have sufficient funds to purchase something and then to purchase it without that purchase being attributed to you, again, to block uh, profiling and surveillance. And a lot of this came about as a result of the work of a cryptographer named David Chom, who was working in the late 80s, early 90s, and was already concerned about the prospect of the internet becoming the world's greatest surveillance tool. Now, another important development in the privacy by design setting is that these technological approaches came to be embodied in various ways in something known as privacy enhancing technologies or pets. And there's a whole movement behind pets. There's an annual meeting, there are competitions to produce new pets. And I just wanted to spend another moment talking about them uh, by, by way of some additional background because it brings out another key distinction. So as you might've gathered in my contrast between privacy by policy and privacy by architecture, I'm much more a fan of the latter. Privacy by policy, again, to be a bit um, uh, rhetorical, can just reduce to a bunch of words that don't come to mean anything. And within the pets movement itself, there's a similar distinction between what are called hard pets and what are called soft pets. So hard pets are mostly about minimizing the amount of data that's ever disclosed to what in uh, uh, European uh, legal terms is referred to as a controller. The controller is the organization that determines the purpose and uses for data that's collected. So data minimization is this core principle that says you should, you should share as little, the controller should collect as little data as possible and the user should share as little uh, data with the controller as possible. And as a result, a number of crypto protocols and related techniques that were developed on the assumption that the data controller is untrustworthy. Now, this doesn't mean that the data controller is deceitful or, or morally dubious or ill-intentioned. It simply means that 
you're taking some risk, you're taking some chance when you share your personal data with any third party. And in that sense, they're untrustworthy. So you want a technique that even in the face of an untrustworthy data controller will protect you. And these are generally referred to as privacy preserving techniques. And just very, very briefly, I'll give you the example of electronic tolls. So let's say an electronic toll system is being developed, whether that's to deal with road congestion or to automatically collect tolls on a toll highway. You can think of a number of ways of doing this. In one of them, you might use a GPS, te GPS based technique with a credit card account. And the downside of that is while it's very convenient, it creates a perfect record of everywhere you've been, uh, how much time you spend in your car, exactly where you go, uh, how much you spend on toll highways, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes very intrusive. Privacy preserving techniques allow you to use the same electronic toll system without revealing any locational information. And again, I won't go into the details of how this is accomplished. They use these crypto uh, techniques, but those are built in in ways such that if a spy agency then comes to the systems provider and says, well, we know you're trying to protect the privacy of this user, but we want to see where did this guy go on this day? The service provider can say that I can't do that. That's not how the system works. It doesn't produce that information. That's very different from a soft pet, which as I said, is mostly about um, data management, meaning it helps you achieve a certain level of control, it allows you to make intelligent choices based on things like transparency. You can have a dashboard that keeps track of what data is being collected. But all of this is basically on the assumption that you have to trust the controller, you have to share a certain amount of data. So clearly the soft pets are much weaker from a privacy standpoint. And it's the soft pets, not surprisingly, that industry has embraced because they do not disrupt the current economic model, which is to collect and monetize as much data as possible. Now, the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, the privacy law now in force in Europe, specifically addresses privacy by design, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But one of the key questions to keep in mind is, what is it that the GDPR requires when it talks about privacy by design? Is it hard pets, which would be very radical and disruptive or or is it soft pets which is just sort of an admonition to industry to say think a little bit more about privacy do a few things that are more helpful but does not represent any kind of radical departure uh, from the current state of things so an obvious point about definitions in order to pursue something like privacy by design or safety by design you have to say what you mean uh, you have to say what privacy is or what safety is. I hope that safety is not as ambiguous and complex a concept as privacy about which there's very little agreement. Uh, we could spend the entire session on the meaning of privacy, so I won't, uh, I won't bore you with that. There are also questions though about even what does design mean? And in the second paper that I did on privacy incidents, which I'll talk more about in a moment, one thing that became clear is that the design concept had at least two very different aspects. One of which was a traditional engineering approach, which you have to state requirements and identify the methods you're going to use to um, develop the functionalities that address those requirements and what metrics you're going to use to determine if you've, if you've achieved success. But the other side of design is, is usability, just like how, do, how does it work? Do people understand that you come to the door and you, you push it open or you pull it open because that's signaled to them in some visual or other fashion? And usability, I think, is just as important as engineering because you can engineer a very sophisticated system and if the end user or whoever is affected by it can't figure out what to do with it, um, then you're not going to have achieved very much. Then you put this all together, you have privacy by design. What does that mean? You have to define that. And again, at least in the privacy by design world, there's this distinction between the policy approach and the architecture approach. So let's um, pause a bit and talk about regulatory models, and then I'll try to pull this all together and comment a bit on the specific 
um, use of privacy by design in the GDPR. So privacy by design has been uh, around as a concept for almost 30 years, and it's been embraced by regulators for quite a long time, but it's taken quite a while for a regulatory mandate to emerge. And during that time, particularly in the US, um, firms have mainly been under a self-regulatory approach, uh, which I think has two key characteristics. One is that it's industry itself that determines the relevant rules. And bear in mind that's mainly industry leaders. So there's always gonna be outliers or free riders who uh, don't actually participate, but take advantage of the notion that this industry is viewed as, you know, viewed in a positive light because it's organized itself around some self-regulatory principles, then they're the outliers. So it's the industry that defines the rules and then it's the industry that also uh, enforces them and often does so in a very friendly and self-interested way. So even self-regulation where it can be somewhat deficient only works if there are sufficient incentives for uh, industry to voluntarily adopt it. In this case, to adopt the privacy by design approach uh, using the acronym PBD. And in the first paper I wrote on this topic, I was mainly looking at these incentives from an economic standpoint and finding that the demand for privacy, uh, at least in the US, was relatively weak in the sense of the so-called privacy paradox that people talked a lot about it, but they didn't really take any steps to protect their own privacy. Even, even the simplest, uh, least consequential steps, much less demonstrating any willingness to pay for privacy. And firms therefore had to weigh that against the very high opportunity course cost of implementing privacy by design, which in turn would mean that they'd forego some profitable opportunities of collecting and analyzing and monetizing data. As a result, there was very low adoption of privacy by design or privacy uh, enhancing technologies. Now that said, there were also these big reputational costs if firms trying to fly under the radar got caught out and the result was some bad press and a big uh, incident that might lead to an investigation. So let's pause a moment and talk about these uh, incidents. First, before I do that though, let's just round out the, the regulatory uh, model discussion. So the alternatives to self-regulation are government regulation and something called co-regulation. Government regulation, of course, consists in a government body defining requirements rather than industry and defining them for an entire class of industry players, not just those who choose to participate, as well as government overseeing enforcement. Now, government regulation can take very different shape. The Europeans tend to be more rights-based, the US more market-based, which basically means that there's more um, balancing of costs and benefits uh, in the US than in Europe, where privacy is treated as a fundamental right and therefore can't be uh, readily traded away against economic benefit. Um, the third option, what many people, myself included, consider the best of both worlds is co-regulation where there's a shared responsibility. Government sets the baselines, but companies have more flexibility to implement uh, their own programs using their obvious expertise to do so. And they may even enforce industry programs, but subject to government oversight. Now, I think this approach has a lot of benefits, but it's also very costly to launch. It requires a tremendous amount of time up front by industry to help define the rules and set the programs in place. And there has to be a strong enough incentive to do that or industry tends to just walk away from it. So that's all I'll say on the regulatory background, but there may be some pertinent questions there and I welcome them if depending what stage the safety by design uh, movement is at, I can, I can discuss how, uh, you know, similar steps were, were, were taken and succeeded or failed to succeed in the privacy by design setting. So let's talk now about uh, privacy incidents. I, I think this is another valuable thing for you to focus on. 
in 2013, I co-authored an article that basically looked at 10 pretty you know, major Facebook and Google privacy incidents in the sense that they were very well reported in the press. They led to Facebook and Google making some uh, changes in their policies and, and practices. And what we sought to discover in this article was whether these incidences might have been avoided if the companies had adopted what we were calling this privacy by design approach. Now, we had to say what that approach was because there were yet, as of yet, no international standards. There were no regulatory mandates. So part of the exercise was to elicit from you know, the literature discussing these and other privacy incidents, what were the basic principles, what were the right approaches, what were the criteria that should govern uh, privacy design, both in the engineering sense and in the uh, usability sense. And we did so ba basically by using this narrative approach. And in, 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 I think one of the benefits of the analysis was that it showed both that privacy by design could avoid these uh, incidents and the reputational harms they create. Uh, we also gave information to regulators about what to think about as they uh, began to take a more regulatory approach to privacy by design. But the analysis was fairly impressionistic. Uh, we didn't use a lot of data analysis. And again, we had to develop our own first principles. Now, that said, this was back in 2013, we've entered a period where big companies like Facebook and Google are so are so wealthy and so powerful that it seems like they just choose to, to weather these storms rather than respond to reputational harm. They, they just ride it out. Maybe their stock takes a hit for a day or two. Maybe they get some bad press. Maybe their CEOs have to go testify but they're big enough and powerful enough to just just ride it out and let it go even in the face of something like the cambridge analytical scandal which resulted in a five billion dollar fine uh, from the federal trade commission in the us maybe this is about to change we'll we'll have to see so with that background uh and again realizing that i'm moving quickly but i'd rather leave time for for questions uh, let's turn to the GDPR, again, the foundational uh, data protection law in the European Union. Article 25 is a specific provision addressing data protection by design and default. So in some sense, this is the culmination of, you know, 30 years of work to enshrine the design concept in a regulation that's binding on all public and private organizations that collect personal data. So in that sense, it's great. But in the third article that I wrote, um, I undertake a fairly severe critique of Article 25 because I think it's really a missed opportunity. The text is very badly drafted. I'll show it to you in just a second. There's a lot of overlap between the apparent requirements of Article 25 to uh, design systems to protect data and dozens of other obligations uh, within the GDPR to respect data protection principles, and it's not clear how to make these consistent. I also think it's unfortunate that the text of this article mixes technological as well as organizational measures. Organizational measures being things like appoint a data protection officer, uh, you know, have a complaint system in place, rather than hardcore requirements to adopt specific types of processes like engineering processes. And then there's some allusion to state-of-the-art mechanisms, but very little clarity about what's really required there. So for my money, Article 25 might have hardwired privacy in, in the sense that it's now built into the very way that systems operate so it's deeply embedded and it can't be overridden simply by you know economic necessity or a bad actor deciding to, to sell some data or whatever the case might be article 25 might have done that but i think it fails to accomplish it so this is the language i'm not going to spend a lot of time on it if you want to review it yourself you'll see that it really suffers from legalese 
the worst part of it, I think, is this language that I've highlighted in bold, where you have to implement appropriate measures designed to implement principles. A really, a really poor way of uh, characterizing this. And you have to do all that in order to meet the requirements of this regulation. It doesn't speak to engineers. It doesn't tell them what to do. So what might it have done instead? Well, again, it might have, in very broad terms, encouraged, if, if not required, at least encouraged the adoption of what I previously identified as hard pets, these cryptographic protocols that offer more of a, of a hard guarantee of privacy. Or it might have very broadly endorsed privacy engineering, which is an emerging discipline with a very specific engineering approach uh, guided by privacy and security principles. Uh, but again, unfortunately, it did neither of these. So in suggesting that this is the right way to go, part of what I'm doing is to say regulations have to intersect with existing uh, technological and engineering measures. Ideally, there'll be international standards that could be referenced. Or, or some other widely adopted approaches. And again, this was an opportunity that was missed by the GDPR, probably for a variety of uh, political reasons. Um, so I think there are various ways to fix it. I'm not gonna spend uh, much time on that because uh, I want to leave time uh, for questions. Suffice to say, I think they, they could have done a better job in, in drafting this. I think another uh, useful idea to consider is for the public sector itself to use its own purchasing power to encourage the approach that it thinks is right. Even if it thinks, oh, it may be too r r radical or burdensome to impose these obligations on, on industry, public sector, meaning government agencies, can kind of take their own medicine uh, by endorsing this through projects that they pay for and, and sponsor. And you can also, again, focus heavily on incentives to look for ways to reward companies that adopt this approach and to penalize companies that, that fail to. So with that, let me conclude by drawing out, you know, what I think are some relevant lessons to be learned from the privacy by design movement and that may have some resonance for all of you we'll see if they do during the q a um, i think it's important to understand the history of safe design in other sectors and see what you can learn from that um, it's in in all likelihood you, you'll you'll see patterns emerge that can be followed in your own setting as well uh, it's important to decide up front on goals and objectives and try to get some broad consensus across multi-stakeholder groups, including you know, government, industry, academia. Look very carefully at regulatory models and which one works. How mature is this technology and this industry? It may be too soon to jump right into government regulations, but self-regulation is always fraught with difficulties and should, should only be a, a kind of opening or preliminary move towards uh, a more mature stage where there's either government regulation or co-regulation. Be familiar with past failures and success. I, again, the, the analysis we did of, of famous privacy incidents was very instructive. Uh, be prepared to influence how legislators and regulators uh, draft any uh, requirements or, or regulations because they're bound to get it wrong, not out of ill will so much as a lack of familiarity with how technical processes works. And then always think about incentives, because even with government mandates, um, that's never going to be enough unless industry sees the benefit, both to its, its customers and its bottom line of adopting this approach. Um, so you have to keep incentive, incentives firmly in mind. So here are the references to the articles if you want to look at them. Uh, and thank you, and I'll take uh, questions now.